Welcome to Soundscapes. My name is Gregor Zubiki, and I have the pleasure of being your host. And also today we will be meeting our friend, the conductor, Anja Bielmeier. Hello, and welcome to Soundscapes the Swedish Chamber Orchestra's own pod. Och välkommen till er alla här i Örebro speciellt. Vi kommer att göra den här podden på engelska. Jag hoppas ingen känner sig exkluderad, men vi riktar oss till en stor publik ute i världen som följer med Svenska Kammarorkestern och vi tänker att this probably goes best in English. So welcome to everybody and uh, my name is Gregor Zubiki and I have the privilege of being the artistic manager of the Swedish Chamber Orchestra, which has its home here in Örebro. And we are sending this from our concert hall. So what is this party going to be all about? I'm not really sure. It's the first one. Um, I'm thinking a conversation about music. Each program will start with a sort of um, vantage point of a program, a specific concert program that we're giving at the hall but it won't necessarily deal just with that program. I think there are a lot of things to talk about. Uh, uh, the whole day-to-day -day running of an orchestra, the challenges that we have, the whole um, musical um, game that we're part of, the, the, the European world situation that we're in. Um, I think there are lots of really interesting things that are specific and interesting things that are general. And, um, a theme, if you like, that I would like to take up is something I call game changes. People or events or things that change the rules of the game. So, so what is a good example of a game changer? A game changer for me is Beethoven's Third Symphony, the music with which this whole uh, pod started. Now, what makes Beethoven's Third Symphony so special? Well, first of all, one has to think about the context of the symphony. Where did it all come from? I mean, if we go right back to the roots of music, I mean, where does music come from in general? I mean, one could talk ever about this, but there is something that connects music, dance, and storytelling. One of the oldest forms of storytelling in music that we know of today, that still exists today, is the mu music of Aboriginal Australia, the original music of Australia, the music that Bruce Chatwin wrote about in his book, uh, The Songliners, the music where, the, the, the idea where the music and the singing creates the country, creates everything, and it's a beautiful image. And, and I think it connects us to, to the fact that music has always been a part of dance and that dancing has been very ritual. I mean, there were dances to create rain, dances for war, dances for peace. So in a way, dancing and music and singing words as a way of remembering history, as a way of telling history. Rune song in, in Finland, for example, a whole way of remembering. So all of this is connected in music. And when our Western classical music had its roots, it had its roots in dance music, but it also had its roots in church. And in the sacred music, of course, that was primarily sung, whereas the, the, the music of the streets and the music of court was the music of dance. And so even when we go to Johann Sebastian Bach and his orchestral suites, they are dance suites, they're movements, minuets, bourrées, uh, polkas, whatever, a series of suites dedicated to a dance each. As music became more complicated, the movements became more complicated and, and moods could change within a movement. And of course, the person who is credited with creating uh, symphonic music is Haydn. Haydn who wrote 104 symphonies, an amazing amount on its own. And, and part of that, he wrote all kinds of other music, operas and quartets and piano sonatas and so forth, an amazing production. But these 104 symphonies still stand as, as a unique monument. I have, have yet, I don't think I've heard all 104 for sure, but I've yet to hear a bad one. They're always funny, they're always interesting, and they have this model that, that, that Haydn created of four movements, a quick movement, a dance movement, a beautiful slow movement, and then a fast finishing movement. Possibly you could change the order around and have the slow movement before the dance movement. But basically, this was the form that Haydn called a symphony that Mozart inherited. And Mozart composed 41 symphonies, which seems a trifling amount compared to 104. On the other hand, Mozart 
didn't have the privilege of becoming as old as Haydn. But in the end of his life, Mozart created three symphonies, four, five maybe if you want to be generous, that really changed the whole substance of what a symphony could aspire to. And it was this situation that Beethoven inherited. And Beethoven writes his first two symphonies as, as an extension of Mozart's. But then comes this third symphony, which is twice the length of the previous symphonies. Just simply on that level, it's a huge step. But it's a huge step on so many ways that in, if you're looking at music history, you could say that there's music before Beethoven's third and there's music after Beethoven's third. And after every composer, whoever wrote music after, in some way has to relate to that symphony. And that's why I would call this a game changer. And I think this idea of game changing on it doesn't always have to be on this huge level, but that's a theme that I would like us to have in, in this program, in our conversations with guest artists and, 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 and the sort of ideas we pick up. I think that the Swedish Chamber Orchestra itself has in many ways, in a Swedish context, been a game changer. I mean, we were the first uh, chamber orchestra in this part of the world who, who recorded the Beethoven symphonies. Um, the whole idea of, of stylistic and other uh, things that we brought in, they were maybe not our own ideas, but there was, we were certainly amongst the first who presented them. And so we changed in many ways the rule of the game here in Sweden. And of course, it's something that we are quite proud of. Um, so these are themes I think that we will be, be looking at going forward. And um, I think with that, uh, it's a good start. And I think we should move directly to our guest of this afternoon, uh, Anja Bielmeier, who is uh, guesting the Swedish Chamber Orchestra for the first time. And uh, I think she's a really interesting person. And let's hear what she has to say about her role coming to an orchestra like us here in Örebro. Hello, Anja. Hello, and Gregor. welcome to Soundscapes. This is the, actually the very first Soundscapes, so that if we reach an audience of millions, it'll be fantastic. Wow, super. Let's but go probably, for it. But probably not likely, not the first one. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, wonderful to have you here and wonderful to have you here with the Swedish Chamber Orchestra. And um, I mean, the Soundscapes is about uh, music and with an orchestral perspective. And of course, uh, conductor is, is integral to this. And, um, and we're in an unusual situation. Uh, as opposed to other places of work, where we have a new conductor every week. Some conductors come back as guests, but even then it can be years between. And even our music director, who's responsible for most, is only here 10, 12 weeks a year. So it's an unusual situation. And you meet many orchestras in your daily sort of line of work. What is it like coming to a new place, meeting a new orchestra? It starts actually with traveling to the orchestra, finding the orchestra, the place where they are. Yeah. So yesterday I traveled from Norway, yeah. from Stavanger here. So it took me 10 hours to find you. So, and then it's on the way when you travel, you think about how will it be? How will the concert hall look like? How is the, the character of the orchestra? How will the week go? So you are already preparing or I'm doing that while I'm traveling. Um, yeah, to think about the situation yeah. because um, it's like a date, you know, you, yeah. meet, you meet the orchestra for the first time and you're very excited and you have expectations and also with the pieces you're conducting, maybe it's the first time you do a piece or maybe you have done it before, but with every orchestra it's, it's very different and you have to, to read the character and to find out what, what, what does the orchestra need and what can you bring to them, how does the whole sound, how is the audience, so it's a very interesting experience and every week it's challenging. It's something new and you have to adapt very quickly and to find out what they need and what they expect from you, that you can bring them together, build a team and make the works come alive. And you have to be a very good time manager, of course, because you only have these certain number of minutes and you have to think how many minutes, how much time do I use here? How do you continue to evaluate that? Absolutely. You try to improve your uh, process, how you work with the orchestra and how you prepare and how you develop within a week. And also it's every week it's different how long an orchestra rehearse or how many breaks are in between. So I always ask and, and for a list where I exactly know so and so many minutes and then I think about how I can do that or... Yeah, it's, that's really a challenging thing and you have to work on that so that you get better and better and don't waste time and use the time efficient, because that makes a huge 
difference then? Of course, you know, but also the way the musicians feel that you're yeah. using their time. So today, for example, um, we, were, we were playing the Schumann First Symphony, and it's been a while since we played it. And you started with a playthrough. Is yeah. that something that you normally do, just to let everybody... At least I try so, yeah. that, uh, that I get a new overview, that mm. we find a way of communication, because conducting is non-verbal communication normally. You don't want to talk that much. So if you start with a new orchestra, we have to learn each other. I listen to what they tell me mm -hmm. through their playing and how they look at me. And then I show them my ideas. And so we develop each, each our music ideas together. So and when we have a run through, we get to know each other. It's like, it's like a, to um, a speech, like a talking to each other. Yeah. And that's nice. So I don't have to stop. So I try to get the flow, to feel them and they feel me. And then in the end, we know when we have played through the whole symphony, we know what we need to do or where we already agree on or... Yeah, so I, I like that, to have first a run through. Sometimes the pieces are so difficult or orchestra does not know or sometimes it's tricky, then you have to stop and to do it step by step. But yeah. this orchestra is brilliant and they read your ideas immediately and I, I hear what they are doing and then it's, it's already starting in the very first minute. So now, it, before the next day, I mean, do you already have a strategy of how, how, you, how you think tomorrow will go? Or, or will you be thinking a lot about this during the evening? No, I know already. I'm the, yeah. I'm, I know what, what we have to do tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and where we go on with yeah. working and where that, that's what you have, like, if you are in that job for, for some years, you have this experience. Yeah. And then it works while you rehearse. You, you, you just keep going on, going on what, what do you need next day? So the, the thing is, when you are in a rehearsal as a conductor, you are in three time zones at the same time. So it's the, t the real time. Mm -hmm. Then you have to lead the orchestra. It's like if you're leading a group of, for example, um, of visitors in, in a city, you know, showing a city, you run in front of them and show them things. It's a little bit similar to a conductor. So you lead them, you're a little bit ahead. You know what will come. And now we have to turn right, now left, now a little bit slower, now louder. So that is this, the second time mm -hmm. zone. And the third time zone is the uh, reflecting time zone. So I'm analyzing. What was good? What was not that good? What do we have to rehearse? When do I have to stop? So it's three things going on all the time in your head in a, in a rehearsal. And that's quite tough in a way yeah. to organize that and to have the right balance, not to stop all the time, but like it's a, like it's a diary. Aha, this went wrong, da, 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 da. Maybe if we play the second time, it will go from alone. Do I have to stop? No. How do yeah. I do? So it's like analyzing all the time. And that's why I already know when I have stopped the rehearsal, I already know what to do tomorrow. You have the script for the next one, yeah. And in the concert, that's the most lovely thing. Everybody knows who everything works because I see myself more like as somebody who is connecting the musicians. So we have a strategy, how we want to approach the, the piece. And then player A knows what player D is doing. So it's like making connections or like in a football team, you know, you have a strategy. And then in the concert, you can just let them free. You can be very spontaneous because everybody knows how the map looks like and how the ideas are. Mm -hmm. And then you can be spontaneous and let them free. And I don't have to analyze anymore. I only have those two time zones. I know what's happening now and I lead them. Yeah. But the, the third time zone is way. So it's just, it's, that's why I enjoy concerts so much. It's a sense of freedom. When you say that about this analyzing, I'm suddenly reminded of a conductor that, that um, Everybody loved uh, Pavel Barilund, mm. the Finnish conductor. Yeah. And he, in rehearsals, he would take small pieces of paper and put them in the score to remind himself of, of that mm -hmm. spot. And if you were playing something and he put a piece of paper in there, you would think, <laughs> oh, shit, what did I do? You know, what's, what's he going to do? And then he would go back and you would be watching for what you thought was your piece of paper, you see. And then he would come there and then it would be something else. And he's like, oh, I'm <laughs> fine. <laughs> So that's one way. Of, yeah, that's one way. Of keeping everybody focused at any rate. Now, now when you conduct orchestras, um, and, and every orchestra I think is, is probably quite pretty unique. Or, would yes, you say that totally. Yeah, totally. Super unique. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're artists yeah. and every artist is different. And then in every country and in every orchestra, there are different artists and how they work together, how they feel each other together. So it's, it's always, it's unique. Do you feel that there's a, is there some a sort of a national trend that, that German orchestras or Dutch orchestras or Swedish orchestras, do they have something in common? 
Can one talk about that kind of thing? I mean, what I can say is, for example, Finnish orchestras are much more quiet than uh -huh. Spanish orchestra, for example. Okay, that one would expect. <laughs> they, yes, they stay more away from each other. They're very quiet and, uh, and they look at you. And when I conducted there for the first time in Finland, I thought, oh, maybe they, do they like me? What is going on? Are they afraid? Nobody was. And then I asked him, what is going on? Why are you so quiet? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and then they laughed because I'm so lively and, and, and very different. And then they, it was a very nice combination. Yeah. So there are some. So it does follow what we yeah. expect somehow. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, of course, um, in your background, I, I was looking, you, you started off in opera houses as well. Yeah. A, quite a classical, in a way, school for a conductor. Yes, I did the really German way. Yeah. Was beginning as a repetitor, yeah. playing the piano eight hours a day, yeah. accompanying the singers, preparing them, yeah. and then jumping in, yeah. conducting a performance without any rehearsal. Mm. Just, Just jump in. Yeah. And either you, do, uh, you make it or not. And yeah. if you don't make it, you're out. That's as easy as it is. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to take the chances yeah. and to be prepared and to be very clear and yeah. brave in your communication and have your nerves under control. Otherwise, you will just not make the way, the German yeah. way. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a tough school, but it must it be a very tough. good school at, at the same time. I'm very thankful it. for it, Yeah, really, because, yeah, um, yeah if you survive that, you yeah. survive everything, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then finally, just thinking about, we've been talking about one kind of role, but you've not just recently taken on the role as being musical director, mm. which gives you a sort of four-year three-dimensional plan. How do you think about that? I mean, it's fantastic to, to develop a relationship with an orchestra, to have a vision, to work on music ideas. So, for example, we in three weeks, we start our first project recording Schumann symphonies because Schumann symphonies, for me, it's so, something so special. And that's one project. So they, so they develop one sound and one way to, for the interpretation. And also, if you do it with one composer, for example, then I think it affects also other things you're doing with yeah. an orchestra. So that's one thing, and we just got this new hall, Amare called, it's amazing, with a new concert hall, with a new instrument. I mean, yeah. I, it, it's, a, it's like a dream. I started in August with them, yeah. in Konzergebau, was my first concert with them, and then now in our own hall. So we found our new sound, or we're still trying to find a new sound in the new hall, and with, with my new orchestra, and the, all the stuff around. We have a great team, yeah. and for me, that makes really the huge difference that from marketing, from the education, from, from all the people around, that we are all a team. And it's really super in the Netherlands. And also with my CEO, Sven Arne Teppel, he's great in programming and he has lots of ideas and we discuss that together. Yeah. And this idea, like to, we are going there, for, we, we want to go for something and together, yeah. that's, I enjoy that a lot because as a guest, it's nice for one week and everybody is happy that you show up and normally, yeah, a new conductor, huh, it's good and everything. But if you can develop a relationship or come back also as a guest conductor more years. You build in a, on something. Yeah, I think that's even nicer. It, it goes deeper. Yeah. And you start with the Schumann project, which now we're doing Schumann. Yes, yeah. yes. So what makes Schumann such a, 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 a favorite of yours? I think it's it's brilliant music and not everybody thinks that. And I, that's why I think we have to show that it's really great music. It's so dark, it's so passionate, it's so specific and so wild mm. and also beautiful in a way. And it's this romantic music and romantic period, which is not just nice, it has so many dark sides and I like that. And of course Schumann had yeah, dark he, sides he in himself. Yeah, he has lots of dark sides and that's how the music is. It's absolutely on the edge. Yeah. And you feel that, that life was a, very tricky for him. Yeah. And I find that extremely interesting in interpret interpreting the, all those works because the composers, normally they don't write it because they were in a happy mood or everything was fine. They had really something very passionate to say or it's some very deep feelings or political aspects they want to, to, to tell us in, in their works. And that's why I think it's so interesting to perform Schumann. Yeah. And this symphony, the first spring symphony is so wonderful. Yes, it's so it's joyous. Wonderful. It's so joyous. You hear like plants and flowers coming out all over it the really place explodes, and yeah. it explodes and so much energy yeah. and, and also dreams 
about future and maybe also some reminiscence about other springs or what happened there. Yeah. Maybe nice things and also not so nice things. It's 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 a whole, yeah, a whole life. It's in awakening. One, it's awakening. Yes, in yeah. one symphony, and it's fantastic because with your orchestra, they they can ju just do everything in the technical oh, musical way. So we can shape it, yeah. and they understand immediately. And it's not one tempo all the time. It's very flexible articulation in colors. So today we already started to search the for fantastic. colors for for specific articulations to make it even more transparent and 3D and to bring this piece to your audience. That is our, our goal, to share it then in the concert. And of course, as a symbolic symphony, for the first week with an open country and life again, you couldn't ask for a better symphony. It's just perfect. It's almost as though we planned it. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Anja, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, you're and, welcome. And good luck with the concert. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful to have you here and I hope we'll be seeing each other again and again.